Good evening. Everybody doing well? Thanks, Steve. Appreciate people listening. All right. You have your Bibles with you. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We'll talk about the gospel. The books of 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus are the last three books believed to be written by Paul. Written somewhere around 67, 68 AD. Written to two different preachers, Timothy and Titus, of course. The book of 1 Timothy, Paul admonishes Timothy, the preacher, to protect the word of God. There are false teachers, things being taught falsely, and things of that nature. And he simply warned them to to be individual that protected the truth. He'll write to Titus. We believe really from a chronological standpoint that Paul wrote 1 Timothy, and then he wrote Titus. And then he wrote 2 Timothy. He wrote to Titus. And he says, Titus, I want you to practice the word of God. I want you to to put it into action. I don't want it just to be words on a page, if you will. And so he told Titus, practice the word of God. So he had protect the word of God, practice the word of God. And in 2 Timothy, he tells Timothy, I want you to preach the word of God. I want you to preach the gospel. If I were to say the word gospel, I'd ask you, what what do you think I mean? And you'd say, well, the word gospel means good news, and it does. It actually is is a compound word in Greek. It's euangelion. You mean good. Angelion is the idea of good message. It's good news. The gospel, then, could be defined as the good news, but then invariably we have to say, well, what good news? And we'd say, well, the good news that Christ was, was, that he was crucified and that he was buried and then he rose again the third day. The good news is the gospel. The good news is, is that there is something to hold on to. Well, Paul, as he tells Timothy, in 2 Timothy, to preach the word, reminds him of the importance of the gospel itself. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, or 2 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning, the paragraph itself begins in verse 9. But beginning in verse 7, he begins to talk about the gospel. Now I want you to think about how he's setting this up. He's talking to a preacher, but he's telling him, I want you to preach the word of God. And in preaching the word of God, you got to know what the good news is and what it's all about. But it's not only just to preachers, if you stop and think about it. To every Christian worker, Paul, in many ways, is addressing this paragraph and saying, here's what the gospel's all about. Well, What is it all about? Well, first of all, you got to understand the gospel is that which has power. Look in verse 7. God's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. God's not given us the spirit of fear. He hasn't intimidated us. And then if you go on down and you look in verse 8, he also makes this statement. Look in verse 8 with me. He says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me a prisoner. Don't be ashamed. Well, why? Well, because the gospel has power. God's not given us a spirit of fear. We shouldn't back down. We don't have to back down. We don't have to say, you know, I don't, you know, uh, as a Christian, I, I can't stand standing up for what's right. No, you can. Because God's going to help you. But God's given you the power. For I'm not ashamed of the power of God. For it is the for it is the gospel of, of God. Romans chapter one verse sixteen. See, the word of God is that which does work within man. 
It is that which convicts. It is that which converts. It is that which changes the hearts of those that will allow it to change their heart. It is that which the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 11, that he hid in his heart so that he might not sin against God. It is that which when Paul was bidding farewell to the church at Ephesus, remember when Paul was on his third missionary journey, Ephesus was was kind of headquarters for him. And for three years he had stayed there, but he had also kind of been in and out. And Paul in in Acts chapter 20 gathers the, the elders of the church at Ephesus together. And he's bidding them farewell. And he says, now, brethren, in verse 32, now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to save your soul. See, the power, which is able, able, the power of God. But now think about what Paul says in verse 7. He says, I'm not, he says, God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but he's given us power of love. You see, as we talked about a little bit about Wednesday night in the invitation, we have to understand the, the difference between intolerance, religious intolerance and tolerance. We have to understand that we have to be folks that, that stand for what's right. But in standing for what's right, we have to be sure that we stand for what's right compassionately and we stand for what's right. We, we stand for with love and we stand for, for, for truth. Paul says, you see, God's given us our love. But also the sound mind. But the Hugo McCord's translation, don't know if you're familiar with it, but the Hugo McCord's translation, he translates the, the word sound mind, he, he translates it as good sense. Some of the, the newer versions translate the word, which makes a little bit more sense to us, and, and from a standpoint of modern day English, we understand it better. But of power and of love, and self-control. The gospel has given us that self-control. The gospel is God's power that changes the hearts and lives of men, but it is also that power to speak freely with love and compassion so that men might lead a life that is self-disciplined. You see, that may be the problem for many is not understanding the gospel and not wanting to receive what is in it, but wanting to lead that disciplined life. And so when Jesus in Luke chapter 14 called upon individuals to, to count the cost to see whether they have sufficient to finish it, And that thought there begins in Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25, and goes through verse 33. Jesus is saying, you got to understand, there's a cost to be paid, and you got to live it. And so Paul says, understand that the gospel is God's power to help get you through it. That the gospel is God's power to help carry you through so that you can do it. And secondly, he says the gospel is also the gospel of salvation. Look in verse 9. Who saved us and called us to the holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Notice what he says. He saved us. We understand that we would not be here on a Sunday night. On a busy day, we would not be here on Sunday night. First of all, coming early and and conducting church business, we would not be here early or on Sunday night to worship God unless we believed that and held to that. The gospel is God's direction that ultimately will save us. And that's the good news, isn't it? The good news is, is that we can be saved. Now, we understand that all unrighteousness is sin. 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. And we understand Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30, the soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, nor the daughter of the, of the mother, vice versa. In other words, 
here the the old prophet tells us he says you stand on your own legs I'm not judged for you. You're not judged for me. But understanding that, then we we understand what? Well, we understand we need salvation. You see, the Bible that talks about heaven also talks about hell. Now, I know that there's a discussion in scholarly circles, and there's a lot of people that just dismiss the idea of hell. It's kind of interesting, people that believe the Bible but yet want to dismiss the subject of hell. I've never understood that because if the Bible missed it on hell, then surely it probably missed it on heaven. And if it missed it on hell, it might have have also missed how I must be saved. The Bible didn't miss it. God has an ideal will. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. God wants everybody to be saved. That's simple. That's God's ideal will. God's circumstantial will, though, is not everybody will be saved. For not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall in the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus plainly teaches us what? Teaches us that not everybody will be saved. And so we ask ourselves, well, what are we saved from? Well, we're saved from hell. We're saved as we're placed into Christ and into eternity with him. While the preaching of the cross is to those that perish foolishness, to those of us who are being saved, it's what? It's the power of God. That's what Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. And so when Paul begins the 15th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, where he talks about the resurrection of Jesus, isn't it interesting? He says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. There's our key word for this evening. I declare unto you the gospel, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you're saved. By what? You're saved by the gospel. And then he goes on in verses 3 and 4, and he explains that gospel into the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel is God's power to save us. And so then, Paul says you need to go know that the gospel is the gospel of grace. Look back again at verse 9. He saved us and called us with the holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to what? According to his own purpose and grace. We'll talk about his purpose in just a second. Well, let's talk about his grace. What is the grace of God? Well, you know, we've heard it defined through the years as the unmerited favor of God. That's a good definition. I don't know that I can improve upon that definition. You might say, well, it's been around for a long time. Yes, it has. But it's the idea of basically being given a gift that you don't deserve and you haven't earned. Within grace is mercy, within grace is God's kindness, and within grace is God's love. It's kind of all there. You might say, well, mercy is separate. Yes, it is, but mercy is also part of God's grace. How do I know that? Well, Ephesians chapter 2, God who is rich in his mercy with his great love, wherein he loved us. By grace, you've been saved. And then go on down to verse 8. Because you've been saved by grace through faith. That not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, creating God, Christ Jesus, into good works. You've been saved by grace. Don't ever speak against being saved by grace. Stand up for being saved by grace. Stand up. For an understanding that those that say you're saved by grace say amen, but at the same time, too, make sure they understand it's not by grace alone. We are not saved by grace alone. It is grace that God provides the salvation for us, but it is also the grace of God that teaches us, right? Disciplines us in many ways. In Titus chapter 2, Paul says in verse 11, 
that that grace that brings salvation teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, to live soberly and righteously and godly. You see, the grace of God tells us here's how you got to live. Here's what you got to be. Here's what you got to do. But isn't it wonderful that God has provided his grace? You've probably heard the story of John Newton who wrote Amazing Grace. There are several different versions out there of the story. But basically because of family situation, he was he began to be a sailor at a very young age. He even captained his own ship for a while. His cargo was slaves. Newton, one time, his ship was caught in a terrible storm. They had bailed water out, and of course in that day you bailed water out by hand. Today the modern ships have pumps, but they bailed the water out, and he was so tired he could not bail out anymore. But in order to save his ship, he was tied to the mast. Or tied to the helm, excuse me. He was tied there from one in the afternoon till after midnight. The storm awakened in many ways, Newton, and so it came to the point when he could put foot on ground that he began to realize that what he was doing was wrong. You see? He was a very rough, gruff. He could drink with the best of sailors. He could cuss with the best of sailors. But he realized, that storm helped him realize, uh-oh, I'm not right. And Newton set out a little later on to write the song Amazing Grace. That's what grace will do to you, though. It gives you, as we talked about this morning, that second opportunity it's the grace of God that leads us. But that grace of God, notice, go back to the verse 9, and notice what he says, according to his own purpose and grace. Well, what's God's purpose? Well, in Ephesians chapter 3, you read about the purpose of God, and to be honest, Ephesians chapter 3 for a long time stumped me. But if you go back and read what you find out, is you find Paul talking about the mystery of the gospel. The mystery, the word mystery, we think of as a spooky story, but the word mystery, the, the Greek word mysterion, has the idea of that which has not been revealed in the past, but is now revealed in the present. And so what Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 3 is he says there is that which was in the past which we didn't understand, which hadn't we hadn't seen all of it. It hadn't come to, to fruition. But now it is made known. It is revealed. Wonderful. What was that which was hidden but is now revealed is the purpose of God. What's that purpose? Salvation of mankind. And how it comes through Jesus Christ. And so, Paul says you need to know. You need to know what? Well, you need to know that the gospel that God gives us is according to his own purpose and grace. And so he set the direction, his purpose, and he set the means, his grace. And notice where it all comes. It's given to us in Christ Jesus. And so he says, this gospel is also the gospel of immortality. Look in verse 10. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Death is one of those things that is very difficult to understand and even appreciate. And probably most, if not all of us, uh, had to, to learn the part of Thanatopsis, the, the poem, if you will, 
so live that when your summons comes to join that innumerable caravan that moves, you know, you had to quote all that for your English teacher. Don't you just love English teachers? And you sat there as a, I don't know, sophomore, junior in high school, and you're thinking, still is this. Well, the reality of it is this man dies. He was 27, supporting men once to die, and after that, the judgment. You and I can't get around that. It's it's interesting how, you know, statistics lie and, lie and, and, st and statisticians use the, their statistics to, to point them in the direction that they want to go. But here's the statistics. 100% of us are going to die. And it's true. But preacher, I want to live forever. Preacher, I, I want to I want to be one that that really just goes on and and, and lives and, and is is forever. Well, you know, here's the truth. We know it well. But here's the truth. I'm just simply reminding you of it. That eternal part that is within all of us will last somewhere for eternity, somewhere. Now, preacher, now you're talking about somewhere. Well, we two alternatives. Hell, we talked about for just a minute, a little earlier, and heaven. We know that God has given us that which is within us, which is affected by what we do while we're alive. But that soul will live on. Remember, Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, and Jesus died, so the thief. And the answer that comes in Acts chapter 2 is, is that in Hades, that's where he was. Now, we can get into all that. There's one or two requests that's been made that, that I, I teach a, a short little course on death, and so that's after we get through the, the book of Judges, that's probably what we'll do on Wednesday night. And so we're going to start the book of Judges um, first, no, yeah, first Wednesday night of July. So when we get through with that, we'll talk about death. But there is within us that soul. And we're reminded in Ecclesiastes 12 that the body returns to the dust of the earth and sold God that gave it. We have immortality. And an immortality that can be with the Lord. Why? Because he's abolished death. When he came forth from the grave, he was death was beaten. Death was defeated. Remember what Paul said? Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, grave, where is your sting? 1 Corinthians 15. Why? Because Christ abolished death. And so here's how Paul looked at death. Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 23, Paul says, I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain here in the flesh is more needful of you. Catch what Paul said. Now, admittedly, when Paul wrote this, when Paul wrote the book of Philippians, it's 62 AD. It's if you're following in the book of Acts, it would be right at the end of the book of Acts. Paul's in Roman imprisonment. He doesn't know if he's going to get out or not. Paul says, I, I have a tug each way. I have pull each way. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. In other words, he says, I can live or I can die. And if I die, I gain. Well, we don't look at death as gain, but Paul did. And as he looked at it as gain, Paul went on to say, it's better that I stay with you. But I want you to know that dying, I gain. And so, when Paul makes that statement that he'd fought the good fight, he'd kept the faith, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which righteous judge shall give me, and not only to me also, but to all them also that love is appearing. But notice what he says. He says, I'm ready to die. And when Paul offers that up, as we know it, he does die pretty quick after that. 
but I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. You see, he faced eternity positively. Why? Because he knew, as verse 10 says, that Christ had ultimately abolished death. And that's the gospel. It's given us that immortality. It's given us the fact that we're saved. It's given us the fact that here we are. We can stay with God and stay with him in eternity. But then, in verse 11, Paul says you need to know that this gospel is also a gospel of service. To which, he says, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher to the Gentiles, or of the Gentiles. Now, you, you get an understanding if you want to go back and understand Paul's idea of preaching to the Gentiles is remember that he had a meeting in Galatians chapter 2, and that's sort of where he and Peter laid, you know, I, I'll just go preach to the Gentiles. And, and we talked about the Gentiles this morning in Bible class. The Gentiles just simply means the people. You were a Jew or you were the people. And the, the two words that, the well, Three words, but the 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 hoi lapoi, which means the people, and the the ta ethnos, which means the nations, are translated in our our Bibles as Gentiles. And so, depending upon the writer and depending upon what he uses, but they basically just mean the people. Paul says, I, "I'm I'm a preacher to the people." But think about what he says. He says, "This gospel, which of which is a power." This gospel which saves people. This gospel which is God's grace. This gospel which provides the immortality that we need. This gospel tells me I can't bottle it up. Look what he says. He says, I was appointed. I was selected. I was chosen. I was appointed a preacher. The word preacher here is the word kerux. Now, unless you've sat in Greek class, that may not mean a lot to you, but it does to me because of the kerux, there are three basic terms that are used in pages of the New Testament to refer to preacher, and kerux is one of them. The kerux was the town crier. The town crier, remember, before the days of radio, before the days of TV, before the days of newspaper, you had a town crier that would go into the, the castle. He would find out the news from the king and from others, and he would go out and he would stand on the corners of the street and he would cry out the news of the hour. He was the herald. And so Paul says, I was appointed, I was selected, I was chosen to be a herald. But not just a herald, but an apostle. The word apostle literally means one who is sent. We think of apostle, we think of 12, right? We think of the 12 and then we think of the 13th one that was added because Judas, he just, he took his own life. Matthias was, took his place. But the word apostle simply means one sent. It's the idea of an ambassador. What's an well, an ambassador is somebody that, that works for a higher up, if you will, and takes what the higher up says and takes it over here to somebody else. This is what you need to know. And so Paul says, I'm appointed to be an ambassador. I'm appointed to be one that takes the message over here. To who? Well, to the Gentiles. To the people. And notice that Paul says then that he's not also appointed, or not only appointed as a preacher, not only appointed as an apostle, but he's also appointed as a teacher. Teacher just is just that. Someone that sits down and someone that instructs. Someone that, that creatively directs individuals' minds in what they're showing them and telling them in order to to further their knowledge and their understanding, whether it's math like Teresa or or, or uh, an English teacher or a history teacher like, like Katie is or an elementary teacher like school, Suzanne was. 
It's the idea of teaching, instructing. Now, here's the point of this point. You are too. You've been called by the gospel of God to be a preacher, not from a standpoint of, you know, not everybody can stand up and preach from that standpoint, but they can be a herald of the good news. To be an apostle, oh, wait a minute. Yeah. An ambassador of God shares the message, God's message with the people as you teach them the way that they should live. And so that's for all of us. It's not just for a few. It's for all of us. Well, our question is, really? Really? And the answer is yes. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, here's the good news. Here's the good news. Share it with others. And so my admonition to you this evening is share the good news. We have a Savior that came to this world and died for us because that's what God wanted. But in dying for us, he gave us life. In dying for us, we now have an eternal resting place that awaits us. And while we have hope here in eternity, that hope becomes reality. What a great gospel we have this evening. If you're not a New Testament child of God, you need to rededicate your life. Won't you come? All together we stand and sing.